It's only in you, God. We bless you for who you are. And we bless you for all that you have done. We come against the attacks of the enemy right now. Against this church, against every member, against every mind, against every heart. We render it ineffective and inoperative in the name of the Lord Jesus. We declare and decree that the light of the gospel will shine forth in the hearts and the minds of your people. That there will be no hindrances in the name of the Lord Jesus. We come against the hinderer himself. The Lord God rebukes you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray that the word of God will have free course in our lives in our hearts, in our minds, in our situations, Father, in the name of Jesus. I praise you that you speak the word today into our hearts and that you give us revelation of your word. Let us grab hold of the word and not let the birds come and pick it up and pluck up the seeds that were sown. But the word will be embedded deep in our hearts and in our minds. You do the work and allow the word to do the work in us. We give you praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise Jesus for yet another day. Something about that name. Something about the name of Jesus. Something that brings a peace. Something that lifts a weight. Something that restores. Something that brings light. Something about the name of Jesus. Welcome to Recognizing Your Atonement Ministries. February the 15th of 2015. I'm sorry, I'm stuck right there on Jesus. I'm just stuck on yes. Jesus. Yes. Something just got me stuck right there at Jesus. You know, as I've been praying, been praying for greater depth in Jesus. Greater notifications from Jesus. Greater visitation from Jesus. Been asking for my desires to shift so that I would want more of Jesus. And as I was in my prayer time, Though there was a totally different message prepared as of yesterday. The Lord said, why not preach of me? And I said, I thought I'd been doing that. He said, you have. You've given standards and you've given character. You've given a whole lot of things for men to see and understand my name. But you get to preach to them how to live in me and not just my name. 
See, it's a wonderful feeling when the name Jesus rolls off your tongue. There's a peace that settles about you and there's a comfort that you get that you didn't have previous. For some strange reason, things tend to shift. Things tend to change. Your mind becomes numb. Once you get and you call upon the name of Jesus, But in the process of this prayer time, where I was trying to stay on wisdom, the Lord told me, there's another word. There's a vocabulary lesson that needs to take place in my name. The word starts with a J. But it's a word that we most commonly misrepresented. Today's sermon is on how do you find your joy? When I say that to you, the most common scripture comes to you, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Presentation for you today of what joy really is. It's a plate of grapes. Some big old, big old, big old grapes, too. Big old healthy joints. I ain't watched them yet, but just some big old grapes. Why would I define joy as being grapes? Anybody? Connected to something. To the vine mm -hmm. with Jesus. Mm. Go to your name. And it's the fruit from the vine. Mm. Okay, that's a good answer. Very good answer. We'll put my grapes down for a minute. And the reason why I say Joy is represented like a plate of grapes. I had to change your mind about some things because now you're looking at me like that don't make sense. Though it was explained, very good prophetic representation, let me give you the definition of joy. The definition of joy is the confidence that settles within one. Regardless of the need, the want, the desire. It is the confidence in God being able to do all things. And it's also the confidence to continue to praise God regardless of. Confidence that God will, will settle on you. A confidence that settles, which means that it ain't bow in your face. A confidence that settles kind of gets low, sinks to the bottom. It's in you. It's rooted. It's deep. It's something beyond what somebody can grab or touch. <coughs> a confidence that settles. <coughs> don't talk about it. Because it's become a part of it. 
You put sugar in, the, in, in some water and let it sit at the bottom. After a while, the water takes on the taste of the sugar. Though it's settled to the bottom, it may not have all the way dissolved. So we're talking about something that's on the inside of you that's marinated. That's literally changed something on the inside of you, though it don't look like it, to you. Glass of water, sugar at the bottom. Still look like a glass of water. Just got some cloudiness at the bottom. But to the average Joe that's thirsty and ain't paying no attention and don't know that the sugar's at the bottom, they're going to drink that water. So therefore, joy is also something that others are supposed to be able to partake of. Hence the grapes. There are fruit, something produced from settling. Seed had to get into the ground and settle. Had to grow and grow and grow. Somehow, some way, there's a huge vine that this was once connected to to generate these. But it had to start with a settling. The reason I'm stuck on the word settle is because I want you to understand that so often, because we define joy as happiness and pleasure, we go <coughs> on a roller coaster ride of emotions throughout our lives, throughout our situations, because pleasure never settles. The appetite for pleasure is always going to be more. Pleasure is a work of the flesh. Happiness is a work of the flesh. Because I can be happy when everything is going right. I can be pleasured when everybody's doing things my way. But when they are not, what has settled in me that's going to keep me grounded? and still allow me to be fruitful. Turn with me to John, the 15th chapter. Coming out of the NIV, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be, this, to be my disciples. 
This is visit to me. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands and remain in his love, amen. if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my father's commands and remained in his love. I stop there. A couple of key points. He kept repeating, I am the vine. In these times, grapes were the staple outside of olive oil as a staple of prosperity. You can eat the grapes, you can make grape juice, or you can make wine. So you had income possibilities with a grape. There were a lot of different things that you can do with this grape that brought you some type of wealth. Well, because of that, Jesus had to use this as a parable. Last week we talked about Proverbs 1, where it says that wisdom helps us to discern parables and proverbs. This parable is something that was common to them. Well, they're making this wine, and they're they eating these grapes, and they're they doing their thing with it. But they're gardeners. They're farmers. They're used to seeing these things grow from seeds. So they're watching, and they're like, wait a minute. Hold on, bro. You're the vine, and God's the gardener. Not making a whole lot of sense. You're the vine, God's the garden. Which means God is tilling the land, God's nurturing it, watering it, and all Jesus is is this seed that grew up to bring forth something for others to be able to eat off of, survive off of, and prosper. Back of your mind, I want you to catch joy. Because the money aspect of it would bring you pleasure. It would bring you your happiness. But the growth aspect of this vine that Jesus describes himself as, that don't sound so glorious. It's not so glamorous. Being connected to the vine, he's telling you, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Which means that there is a connection. I'm connected. Each one of these grapes is connected to one another in some type of way. Cut them off and let them sit there, and they will die. Many times we sit back and we're looking at joy as not being attached to somebody or accountable to somebody or wanting to take from somebody. We want to be able to do it on our own. But he says that you can do nothing without me. He says that if indeed he's not in you and you not in him, there is no fellowship. There's no relationship. If you pay attention to the grapes, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on these joints now. They're really intimate with one another because they're all close and cuddly. And... But if you look at them, they're huge. Something is growing and it grew and it grew and it grew. But watch this. He says the father prunes it once it becomes fruitful. I want you to catch the parts of your joy that the world has told you, has tricked you, bamboozled you into thinking was pain. If 
those things had feelings, if they could feel like we feel, when they were cut from the vine, when they were cut off the branch, it would hurt. They would feel rejected. They would feel desolate. They would feel separated. They would feel what the world would say would be sorrow. Many times in our lives, God is coming through and you got a good thing going on. And God is literally pruning the bush. He's pruning the branch. He's taking off the fruit. Well, you took this from me. Why? So something else could grow in its place. Something bigger, something better. Something that we would call joy. I'm going to get further down in the scripture because it actually says it. But because we're confident that the gardener knows what he's doing and it's settled in us, I don't worry about the loss because the loss is really a gain. The loss in this season only says, guess what? It's there to feed and provide for others. But if indeed I get to a place where I get up in my feelings and I lose my joy, my grapes are no good. So the next season comes around and nobody can eat from them. Not even me. As I'm going through this scripture, and I mean, it's a tricky scripture to actually preach and not do it like everybody else has done. I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, reveal something different. And he says, I need you to pay attention to the grape. So I watched a few, and I bit into it, and I looked in the middle of it, it was this big old seed. Well, if my fruit has a seed, that was passed on to the next person, guess what Jesus is about to do again? God is the gardener. He's now the vine. What am I passing on to others that is fruitful? What can be fruitful? Well, I can give love, and I can give peace, and I can give long-suffering, but here's the funny part about it. Who really wants it from you if you have no joy. Mm -hmm. How can I counsel someone? How can I pray for someone? How can I love on someone when I don't have joy? How can I go through the ups and downs of relationship with another if I can never find the joy in the relationship? Now, I want you to catch something. If Jesus is the vine, and God's the gardener, and he's pruning, who is he pruning? Jesus. He pruned Jesus. Son of God. We are sons of God. He pruned Jesus. The seed that we bit from, or the grape we bit from, had a seed in it, and it settled in the ground. And as it settled in the ground, Jesus sat back and he grew up as a vine again. He grew up in our lives. You can't dwell in something that you're not spending time in. You can't abide in something that you're not living in. So therefore, if he's in you and you in him, that means that there's a residence that has to take place. There's an occupancy permit that has to be obtained. In gaining that occupancy permit, I now have the right to take that seed and throw in my land. A couple of months ago, we were preaching out of Matthew, I believe it was 13. We were talking about the treasures. You can't dig, uh, you can't dig in a land that don't belong to you. Well, guess what? If I'm in him and he in me, the seed can go. Because he has rights. Which now gives me those rights. 
We're abiding in a house together. There's a relationship. There's a fellowship. There's going to be some arguments. But just like you would do with your spouse or your roommate, you work them out. I hate to tell you, he's going to win every time, but it is what it is. Because again, if you look at the order of operation, God being the gardener, he's the vine. You connect it to the vine, which means that you're in his space. Creator of all things. Heaven and earth. So if you're in his space, you now have to learn to get along with him. You have to learn to abide with him. You have to learn to get to a place where you have confidence that he's going to shift the nutrients down the branch, through the vine, to you. For your source of survival, for your source of sustenance, for your source of being able to stretch out and get a little sun, for your source of being able to be happy just being a fruit. Well, the problem with that is many times in our minds, again, being Oh, wrinkly, crumpled up great. That ain't exactly the, the role we want to play. We want to be a vine. Sometimes, we don't mind being the branch, but we don't want nobody to pick from us. We don't want to offer up anything to anybody else. Well, if there's nothing to pick from you, again, you're dead. The Word of God told us that He prunes those things. He lets them wither up and die, and He throws them in the fire. So basically, in a selfish lifestyle, in a fleshly lifestyle, a lifestyle that's geared towards pleasure and happiness, not joy, you're dead wood. You're a bonfire. So, if I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, if all I'm going to be is a branch that holds grapes, and maybe I'm just the grape itself. Maybe I'm the seed of the grape. I don't know. But if I have this little bitty role in this, I can't grandstand. I really can't be selfish because there's too many of them around me. I guess I just got to hang in there for the ride, huh? I got to literally say, hey, dude, it's a dry down here. Dude, I, I need some help. Dude, I don't really get what my role is. I don't understand why. I'm just sitting here, limp, with all this heavy stuff on me. What am I supposed to be doing, Jesus? What's my place? <coughs> what did I call these? Joy. Nothing more, joy. Because once you come to a fullness of joy, you're mature in him. You're mature with him. Did I lose you? Say it. Okay. No vine, right? There's no vine connected right now. Right? Worshiping, folks can come just pick from, right? But once all the fruit is gone, what are we going to do with that? Can't take no joy in that, can you? But what about the piece of you that's still connected? If you ever made the connection. The whole goal in a relationship is to become total, to become complete. 
with those that you're in relationship with. So once you become into relationship with Jesus, the goal then is to become total and complete in him. If you got married, you will want to become total and complete in your husband. Because otherwise, you're going to look at him like, what you doing here? What I need you for? If I can do bad by myself. Sorrow. Opposite of joy. Okay? I'm going to skip down to 15. And... Let's go to verse 11. Actually, we'll start at 9. I'll be good. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you, commit, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So basically what he's saying is, because I'm divine and you need connection with me, everything that I have that holds me up in joy, everything that's built me up in joy, everything that keeps me stepping in joy, I got from daddy. But you also have it too because you remained connected. Plug up an electronic. Take your cell phone, you, you, your battery going dead, you plug it up to the wall, right? Because you need some juice. You need some power. Guess what joy really is? If I am settled and confident that the Lord thy God has this thing, I know that because nothing is impossible to them that love the Lord, which he just said, remain in my love as I remained in my father's love because he plugged into God and you plugged into him. So therefore, greater works than these shall you do in my name. Therefore, as you move and have your being in the earth and you plugged in, Nothing can come before you and harm you. Because guess what? Your joy said, that's a situation. That's God. Well, many times we get a little down about our joy because we feel like, like the grapes are, they dirty. But the thing about it is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. I'm plugged up into the Word, and the Scripture told us that the Word cleanses you. So now we're sitting back and we got the Word active in my life as I'm plugged up. I'm getting all the nutrients. I'm getting all his goodies. And God just coming by saying, okay, that's fruitful enough. That's the body of that. Okay, well, I don't really like that. Let me snap that off of you, too. Because that, that, that's dead weight. We don't need that. And then God comes by and you're looking over and you're like, oh, you're laying a little bit there. Hmm. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That means either you breaking away from the vine, so I got to bring something to encourage you to help build your confidence just a little bit more so that you can stand up and say, I do. I'm willing to stand here. Limp. Well, the Lord get a little heavy because these things getting big, and they're getting bigger, and they're getting bigger, but he ain't going to let you fall. He ain't going to let you fall because at that point in time, God will say, oh, that's fruitful enough. Let me snip. Joy. Because what you fail to understand is though you lost something, it was weighing you down. Though you lost something, it was really for somebody else to have in the first place. The problem being, you were holding on to it. You were trying to live with that thing instead of living with the love of Jesus. You were trying to live with something and look fruitful to be important. The problem being, the branch is very important. But it don't look important. It don't have to.
to look important. It does not need validation because of where it's located, because of what it's located to, because of what is taking care of it. These things bring about a fruit, a fruitfulness for others to see and partake of and begin to plant. The issue that we walk through so many times in our life, we're looking for the happy spot. The happy spot validates. The happy spot says, I'm important. The happy spot says, see me. The pleasurable spot says, I got this. And you got to cater to me. You owe me something. Being plugged into the source, being plugged into the vine, and letting the gardener have his way. It takes your name from you. It'll take your title from you. Sometimes it'll even take your confidence from you because he has to allow you to go through a process of a seedling to grow. You get into a new house, you don't come into that new house, slap your furniture up, and just live. That thing has to be created and catered to your liking. Well, guess what? How is Jesus going to come into a house that you invited him into and you didn't let him make any changes? You didn't let him make any alteration. He might have just wanted to throw curtains up instead of blinds. But instead, you're ready to put them out. He might have wanted one room purple. You might have wanted it red. And y'all <laughs> at each other. And in the midst of it, you're sitting in this house together and you ain't got no joy. It's miserable because you're always fighting to just live. But the Lord says today, there's safety in that home. There's comfort in that home. There's a newfound joy in that home. When you move in a new house, you clean that joint before you put anything in it, right? When you're looking at this vine, this is what God's doing with our lives. Things that are dead, he's cleaning the vine up. Because dead things bring thorns and thistles. They bring weeds. And when weeds grow up, it chokes out things. So God comes through and he cleans it up. The funny part about it is, we're sitting back and we look at well, Jesus should have this role. Should. Difference being, Jesus said, I will play my part so that you'll understand that when it's time for you to play your part, you got an example. I serve my father. Who are you serving? I'm being cleaned up by my father, though I ain't got nothing wrong with me. But you better believe when he was on earth, he was tempted with everything that you were tempted with and probably more. And he had to dispel the thoughts. He had to dispel all those things in front of him. And he had to respond with joy. I'll give you a perfect example before I go to the next scripture. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he had already told the disciples he was going to die. It had been revealed to him what he was about to go through. He knew the trip up the road. He knew the beatings. He knew how it ended. If he 
was stuck on happiness and pleasure, would he have done it? He had to learn to take joy in the ugly assignment. He had to learn to take joy in the thing that he probably didn't want to understand. Yeah, I know it's for them, but you see them? I love them. Then abide with them. Oddly enough, he's saying abide with me. Telling you, okay, I done came down here. Lived among you. With all this nonsense. I done died for you. Amongst all this nonsense. Now, I'm asking you to come out of your regular comfortable home and live with me. Be my roommate. Be my cuddle buddy. Or as the kids call it, be my boo thing. Jesus is inviting you in now. Come abide in me. And just because we don't get along, I need you to remain there. I need to know that you're faithful there. I need to know that you're loyal there. Because in this place, you will find joy. Well, let me take you one further. Turn to Psalm 16. Because we talked about Jesus, and we were sitting back and we're like, wait a minute. If God is this, and he's the gardener, and Jesus is plugged into the gardener, where did he get? Well, let's take you back to where David was hollering. Jesus not yet born. I'm going to read this out of two different versions because I really want you to catch something. Coming out of the NIV. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say to the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body, is also, my body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful one, faithful one see decay. You made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. A couple of times in this scripture, we're talking about the right. When you enter into a church and you join the church, they give you the right hand of fellowship. Normally when you held your mother or father's hand across the street, you grab their right hand. I say this to you because there's a safety with his children. As a father, if I got my baby boy and I'm crossing the street, give me a hand, boy. And we're going to go together. Wait a minute. We're connected. 
The verse said, I'm secure in that lot. That lot would be land in which I live, in which I form on. It talks about pleasures and delights. But there's more pleasure at his right hand. Where is Jesus seated? At the right hand of the Father. So therefore, if I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father, connected to Jesus, and Jesus connected to God, the very things that David was talking about, I'm secure in this house. I'm good right here. Don't matter if they're trying to kill me. Don't matter if they're trying to destroy me. Whatever I put my mind to, with joy. Jesus said, anything that you ask of me, if you remain in my love, will you not have? So therefore, if I'm dealing with these things, I know that in my joy, well, if you ask in faith, you can't ask in faith if you ain't got no joy. That means you doubted it. Remember what joy is. It is a confidence that settles within you that God got it. There is no faith in it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I'm sitting back and I'm hoping for something, but really don't believe God going to do it, the definition of joy just went out the window. But so did faith. You can't have joy unless you know him. See, where I wanted to go to wisdom, the Lord said, no, I need you to give them wisdom. Where I wanted to define wisdom, he said, no, give it to them. And many times, wisdom is the most simple thing up underneath our nose that we don't pay no attention to. The way kings used to eat these, as I saw them in the movies, this was a temptress. They didn't even pull it off. They just put it in their mouth. But if a king did it that way, imagine what your fruit gave them. Imagine the favor that comes behind what just came, got snipped up off of you. Imagine where you were sitting back and that fruit validated you. And you had joy enough to say, he going to keep coming back. What more will God not give you? What is God going to withhold from you? If kings are in your favor, if kings need you to bear something that they can't get. There's several people in the world that we encounter on a daily basis. And we're in conflict with them, but really not. We're in conflict with him because we didn't want to catch the pruning. Snip. Oh, they need them grapes, bro. They need that fruit. You worried about your prosperity. You worried about holding on to it. But that little bit of fruit, Snip, is going to bring you back many, many, many more clusters. Because for a branch that started out this big, after it was pruned to this big, ended up growing to be that big. So instead of having one of these, you now got 50. Imagine God sitting back saying, okay, let me snip this dead plant or this dead branch, this dead up off of you. Something that been trying to grow off wasn't quite right. And you didn't want to because it, it, it had a couple of grapes on it. No, no. God said, I ain't trying to grow no raisins. <laughs> you eat the raisins, they don't fill you up. Raisins don't produce any further fruit. They're nothing more than a dying, dried up grape. There's no seed in a raisin. It's 
So that means, though it was created by God, it's the dead thing. Which means it was supposed to be thrown where? In the bonfire. The difference being, if you're looking to become fruitful, you're looking for a different place in joy. You're looking for a different outlook on life. Go no further than your grocery store. Go through the produce aisle and bless God. Bless God for pruning you. Bless God for the opportunity to abide with him as he provides for you. Bless God for the strength to be able to hold up what you thought you could. And then lighten your load. So that you can become stronger and hold more. Bless God for the opportunity to live in, co in close proximity, close quarters. Because Old Testament times said you can't get near God unless you were the priest with the bell tied to your leg. And if you wasn't quite right, he was dead. Well, if he's the vine, I'm the branch. And God goes, snip, snip. That means I wasn't quite right when he had to snip, snip, huh? I got a new mercy. I got a new chance. I got a second chance. And guess what? I got a chance to go to the throne because I'm connected to him. So often we go to the man of God for the prayer or the woman of God for the prayer. The bad part about it is that just literally says, I don't really abide in you, bro. Because I got to go find somebody that's connected to you. My elbow connects my form to this part of me, Right? Jesus, the muscle, moves me. Hey, man, I need to go get such and such to pick up the cup. Okay. He moves me. The question is, are you moved? In the opportunity to abide with him. Are you moved in the opportunity to pray to him? Are you moved in the opportunity to be pruned so somebody else can eat? Are you moved by the fact that you've been cleansed by the word, which means the word is in you because you dwell with the word, you abide in the word, the word abides in you. So therefore, if you move in my love, you will be speaking the word. How can you abide, live with, dwell with something that you know nothing about? Are you moved to do it? When there's a situation before you that a person is stuck on happiness and pleasure, can you be moved because you dwell? He's the strength. He the muscle. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. The word washes you. The word abides in you and you in it. Which means you become the muscle. What can you say? What can you say? If the word does the work. Problem being, if you're not speaking it, who did the work? Where were you living? Did 
did they get grapes? Or did they get raisins? A grape is going to have a seed in it, which means that they can sow the seed. Which means there's going to be a continual cycle of life. <clears throat> he said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. If I'm giving you life and life more abundantly, why am I giving you raisins that can't produce nothing later? If I'm stuck on the right hand of the Father, and I don't mind being in a long line of folks stuck on the right hand of the Father because we all connected to the same vine. We all connected to the same source. And we're all in unison for the same purpose, doing the same types of things. In a dying world, <coughs> the world don't die. In a dying world, there is food, there's substance, there's income because the fruit brings income. It brings prosperity. <coughs> but I'm secure in my position of branch. I'm secure there. Why? Why do I need to be secure there? Think of it this way. What happens with a tree when a branch falls? They pick it up and it becomes trash. I'm secure being a branch. Because the one thing I never have to worry about is pieces of me will fall off. I will never fall. Jesus is the muscle. And he will hold me up. And even when I'm almost on the brink of death, he will resurrect me back to life. Because he cares about me enough that he does not want me, nor will he tolerate me producing raisins. I'm going to stop there. No, I'm not. That is good, Isaiah. Again, I'm the NIV. Come all who are thirsty. Come to the waters, and you have no money. Come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the riches of fair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that ye may live. And I stop there. And I want you to catch something between verse 2 and verse 3. What does he keep saying?
John 15. I'm the vine, abide in me. I'm the vine, abide in me. Abide in my love and abide in me. Abide in me like I abide in my Father. Then he says in Isaiah 55, 3, Come to me and give me your ear. Why? I am the vine. Listen to me. You are trying to connect with me. You can't connect with me if you don't know about me. Faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. So therefore, if indeed I'm not digging, I'm not searching, I'm not listening, I'm not hearing, and I already know what I know, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm working for stuff that just don't satisfy me. Pleasure, happiness. Come by with no money. What's the currency? Talk to me. What's the currency? How do you buy with no money? I'm going to read it again. I want you to think about this. Let me set a backdrop first. People who have been enslaved, they're in a desert land. It's dry. They're fighting for water. They're fighting for food. They are not connected to the vine. So they don't have anything to eat. There is no income. There is no prosperity. There's no fruitfulness because as Psalms, the 16th chapter told us, if you are going about worshiping other gods, I will allow the bloodshed of you and those guys to deal with one another. So they're at war with the Father. in us to supply for us. God is a discerner of men's hearts. Correct? If he knows that if he gets you through it, you're going back to it. Is he going to say come by with no money? If you've been doing this since the beginning of time, coming out of Egypt, you did it. In the times of Samuel, you did it. Throughout the times of the judges, you did it. Through the reign of David, you did it. In the reign of Solomon, you did it. You've been <laughs> enslaved by these folks constantly. But not because God didn't protect you. It's because you disconnected. How do you connect? Talk to me, y'all. Come on. How do you connect with God? How do you connect with Jesus? Because honestly, if you don't get that part of it, you didn't get none of the message. Bless you, child. How can I dwell with someone that I don't know? How can I abide in someone that I don't know? How can someone live in me that I don't make room for? What's the key to a, a relationship? 
any relationship. Coming to know one another is how you doing? Connecting, talking. Ah, say that again. Connecting, talking. And Which one of the words mean more? Connecting. Talking. Good job. <laughs> talking. So if Jesus is sitting back, they've been praying to God forever. Rescue me. Save me. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I'm tired of working for them for nothing. I'm tired of doing this for nothing. Come back. Come drink. Come eat. <coughs> you need a drink. First thing he's saying is, come. Which means that he's telling you wherever that disconnect was, come on back. Then he says, listen, now that I done fed you, now that I done gave you some water, now that I done built your confidence up a little bit, listen. Wait a minute, he didn't say it once, he said it twice. I'm sorry, he said it a third time. He said, give me your ear. Because you didn't hear me the first two times. <coughs> He's literally saying, you know what? Come on, listen. Let me tell you something. Let me, come on, let me tell you another little secret. Let me tell you a little more. Let me give you a little bit more of it. You ain't quite hearing me. You heard me. You know what you heard, but you don't know what you know. <coughs> give me your ear. <coughs> give me a piece of you. Wait a minute. Somebody move in. They want a bedroom. <coughs> your ear is connected to your mind. Right? Hmm. So whatever goes in your ear goes straight. Bing! Give me your ear. Let me renew your mind. So that you can be connected. So that you can find joy in the midst of. Because even in your disconnect, I provide. Mm -hmm. Even in your disconnect, I kept you protected. Even in your disconnect, I kept you healthy. What more would I do for you if you were connected? What more would I do for you if I actually had residence there? Would I not pay the rent? Would I not take care of the gas bill? Would I not put food on the table? How about this? And this is a good one, because this is something we all deal with. Would I not keep you from being lonely? Will I not build your confidence? Because I'm a forgiving God, will I not forgive you? when you had a problem doing it yourself. Will I like you even though you don't like you? And because I said I would never leave you nor forsake you, the only reason I'm not in your proximity is because you went there. The whole scripture and all of this. We can talk about the grapes. We can talk about the, the vine. We can talk about the branch. But if indeed you don't come to him. And when you get there, you're listening to him. How can he provide for you and help to shape and mold you when you doing you? If y'all ain't talking, 
Y'all can't get on the same page. Y'all can't walk in a spirit of unity. There is no bond of peace that you would have with him or anybody else. You're producing raisins. So if you feel like it's dry, if you feel like there's more that you need to know, if you feel like you're missing something in that relationship with him, where we've been begging him to come, we need to change our language and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm coming. We need to repent for the places we went unauthorized and say, Lord, I'm coming back. I need your resurrection power. I need your source. I need your security. I need your comfort. I need your counsel. Because your word said that I will live and not die. Even when the devil thought that he won it and thought that he killed you, if you resurrected and came back, and I'm plugged into you, and you told me greater works, that same spirit, that same power, that same authority, that same presence at the right hand of the Father belongs to me. That same security at the right hand of the Father belongs to me. And what you'll find is the more rooms of your house that you open up, the more you'll have. The more rooms that you open up in your house, the less clutter you'll have in your life. The more rooms that you open up in your house, you'll find that there'll be more room for other people. And all God going to do is come down and say, hmm, it's a good cluster of grace right there. Snip. Here you go. Come by with no money. Mm. Come drink. With no money. The same way he wooed you, he going to pluck from you and woo somebody else. All because you opened up a few rooms. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you today. We bless you again for coming clear, for coming to the point and piercing our hearts. We bless you for your word. We bless you for your spirit. We bless you because you have not given up on us. Father, we pray right now that every seed that has been grown, every seed that's been sown, Every seed that's been scattered, that it settled and increase our joy. We pray right now that you help us to understand, that you reveal unto us a greater revelation of what joy really is in you. That you bring us to fullness, that you bring us to a maturity. That we would be honored and have the honor of being pruned, O oh Father. That we would be vessels just like the branches stemming from Jesus, producing a good fruit. That we would be nourishing and that we, in turn, would become vessels for you so that seeds could be sown into the sowers. 
Father, we bless you right now. As we come to drink from you, as we come to eat from you, we know that this thing has been freely given unto us. And we call upon your joy to give it back freely. We call upon your joy to strengthen us in the midst of. We call upon your joy to build us as we open up our hearts, as we open up our minds, as we open up our understanding. For we are not afraid to come before the throne. Your word says come boldly before the throne of grace. So Father, we come to you today with bold expectation and bold ambition because otherwise we cannot pray to you with joy. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we ask for your spirit to come down, to burn up, cut up, destroy every spirit of angst. To destroy every spirit of confusion. To destroy every spirit of doubt. Continue to cut off the dead things in our lives. Though the pool may not feel good, though the process may not be just right to us, but Father, we trust you that you ain't going to cut off nothing that's alive. We trust you that you're not going to allow anything to harm us. We trust you that you are the source that you will provide, and in the next season, and maybe even in this season, greater shall fall. We trust you, Father, so that our joy may be complete. And Father, we ask right now that you help us to trust ourselves so that we may be able to remain in you. That we may be able to abide in you. That we would be able to dwell in you. Unconditionally. In totality. Pour out your spirit, O oh Father. Teach us. Teach us what it is that we need to know. Your word just taught us to come. So we reach out to you. We press forward to you. We reattach to you. We rededicate ourselves to you. We press our ears to your lips so that we may hear you. No longer looking just to listen, but we want to hear you, Lord. In all things in our lives, we want to hear you. For all instruction, for all counsel. We want to hear you, Lord. And for the spirit that jumps out and dares to say, you don't know what you're talking about. We cancel that assignment right now in the name of Jesus. We cancel that imagination right now in the name of Jesus. For I am a blood-bought believer connected to the source and I stand in my rightful authority using the power of the one who's invested in me. Canceling your assignment right now in the name of Jesus. You will not steal this seed. You will not cancel out this seed. This seed holds weight from heaven. You cannot have them. This seed holds fruit from heaven. Prosperity and joy, delight, and security. So I call upon my Father to step in on my behalf as I take my rightful place at his right side. In Jesus' name, you have no power. 
In Jesus' name, you have no authority. Silence yourself right now. Comfort, oh Father. Send your spirit. For he's called the comfort. We hold no doubts in what he does. But we ask that he does a quick work today. That this word is sealed up in the hearts of your people. And that this word manifests in the lives of your people. We ask for a quick work today. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen.